The Social Dilemma is a 2020 Netflix documentary about how a bunch of 20 to 35 year old white guys in Silicon Valley write algorithms that control the lives of billions of people. Have 50 designers, 20 to 35 year old white guys in California, made decisions that would have an impact on 2 billion people. Made by a bunch of 20 to 35 year old white guys in Silicon Valley. The film is doing a reasonably good job explaining in lay terms there's a problem with the big tech and it doesn't have a name. Like there's a problem happening in the tech industry and it doesn't have a name and it has to do with one source, like one. I can't trust someone who talks like that. That's tech speak. It's English, but it's tech speak English. It's letting you know. It features genius minds of Jaron Lanier, Chimath Palihapitiya, or Marco Rubio. Wait, what is Marco Rubio doing here? We are a nation of people that no longer speak to each other. We are a nation of people who have stopped being friends with people because of who they voted for in the last election. We are a nation of people who have isolated ourselves to only watch channels that tell us that we're right. Damn, that's a good speech. That got me fired up. But I got a better one. And let's dispel once and for all with this fiction that Barack Obama doesn't know what he's doing. He knows exactly what he's doing. Let's dispel with this fiction that Barack Obama doesn't know what he's doing. He knows exactly what he's doing. This notion that Barack Obama doesn't know what he's doing is just not there true. There it is. He knows exactly what he's doing. There it is, the he's... memorized 25 second he... speech. <laughs> The Social Dilemma describes a problem of biased algorithms manipulating users and entire masses of people, slightly nudging their behavior that benefit whoever is paying for ads on social media platforms, advertisers, campaigners, malicious groups, or foreign interference. It has led to the polarization of the society, fake news manipulation, mass surveillance, violence, censorship, and any other naughty word you can pull from a dystopian fantasy novel. The documentary has shown a major success, and its producer appeared on the Joe Rogan podcast discussing the issue at more length. And you know, you made it once you appear on JRE. The social dilemma was seen by uh, 38 million households in the first 28 days on Netflix, which I think is broken records. If you're thinking, though, you've been making videos on these exact issues for years, it sounds like you're gonna complain right now. Well, I'm just salty I wasn't invited. Joe, what the fuck? On the surface, this may sound all great. People are finally becoming aware centralized tech is a problem that needs to be dealt with. This could lead to re-decentralization of the internet and free and open source software finally replacing corporate dinosaurs. Except that's not the conclusion of the documentary. The Social Dilemma criticizes centralized and proprietary social media platforms, but the film has no mentions of free and open source software. It doesn't mention a single individual open source alternative. And why is this an issue? Because open source Sourcing centralized technology would eliminate the unfair positions of the big tech corporations and invite more competition from free software developers that actually care about user rights and privacy. The documentary correctly identifies that all of the big tech platforms are slaves to their own business model. They are publicly traded corporations, which means they have shareholders and shareholders care only about one thing, quarterly earnings. In case you missed it, it's just a business model. A business model, shareholder value, shareholder pressure, quarter over quarter. So tech platforms will do anything to increase those earnings, even if it has negative side effects on the broader society. They don't have to change anything about their business model. Thus, the film argues we need regulation to put an end to it. And all the interviewees seem to unilaterally agree with this narrative. And that is why I think we need regulation. We have a lot of laws that make sure they don't do the wrong thing. The law runs way behind on these things. And they should be outlawed. But this isn't the root cause of the problem, it's just part of the problem. The true root cause of this reality is that publicly traded corporations are only facing competition from other publicly traded corporations. They're effectively acting as monopolies, duopolies, or de facto oligopolies. Introducing regulation the film proposes, such as taxing data collection, would increase the cost of running business for small developers, while large corporations would overcome the extra costs. This burden would only eliminate competition and further consolidate the market already dominated by the big tech. The real solution has to revolve around introducing competition to the entire business model of a publicly traded corporation. It has to be a model that is absent of the shareholder value incentive and a legal monopoly on software. There's only one model that fits both of these criteria, free and open source software. The business model of free and open source developers is based on donations from users, software contributions from the community, or generating revenue from hardware sales and renting. The reason publicly traded corporations 
corporations don't have to worry about competing with free and open source software is because the current legal framework is favoring centralized corporations and proprietary software. Open source developers are inherently placed in an unfair position, as public corporations can use source code from free software, but free software is not allowed to use proprietary source code. Copyrighted platforms create ecosystems where they unfairly favor their own products and prevent users from opting into free and open source alternatives. To undermine the growth of open source movement, tech corporations issue licenses to prioritize each other's proprietary platforms and eliminate any potential expansion of free and open source software. And in a covert tactic, large corporations strategically drag smaller businesses through expensive lawsuits and legal proceedings that even if they lose, at least cause existential financial damage to smaller businesses. The most logical solution to level the playing field is to remove proprietary protections for all front-end software, including end-user applications, software development kits, and application programming interfaces. By making all software licenses open source, developers will be able to meet users' demands where tech corporations fail to do so. These alternative apps will be able to exist without the fear of legal punishment. Users will not be confined to the narrow ecosystems of proprietary software and copyrighted platforms. The social dilemma, despite receiving a lot of praise and attention, is an entirely one-sided opinion piece of a group of individuals with a very similar background. All of the interviewees featured in the film are already agreeing with the overall narrative the documentary wants to convey. Even though it's an open criticism of the Silicon Valley giants, the documentary could have featured interviews with executives or other representatives of corporations they are criticizing. It'll be interesting to hear what Facebook COO Sheryl Sandberg or Twitter founder Jack Dorsey had to say about this critique. Instead, the film follows a plot of a fictional family having a drama over the use of mobile phones and social media at a dinner table. Isla! Oh my god. The tone of documentary shifts towards the end of the film, suggesting that if no action is taken, we can expect civil war in the shortest time horizon civil war or even a destruction of the whole civilization we probably destroy our civilization through willful ignorance and your child will be arrested for bumping into someone on the street The social dilemma is speaking to the masses in a dangerously self-important way Tristan Harris suggests that technology isn't going away and there is nothing you can do about it the race to keep people's attention isn't going away our technology is going to become more integrated into our lives, not less. The AIs are going to get better at predicting what keeps us on the screen, not worse at predicting what keeps us on the screen. Which is followed by our heroes coming up with their plans of regulation to save us all. But I am reluctant to fall in behind this ideal if it isn't logically sound and proven that other solutions are better. For example, one of the few concrete regulations suggested in the film was introducing taxes for data collection in a similar way we tax water usage. We could tax data collection processing the same way that you, for example, pay your water bill by monitoring the amount of water that you use. You tax these companies on the data assets that they have. It gives them a fiscal reason to not acquire every piece of data on the planet. That's a logical fallacy. Water resources can be exhausted, and you're paying cash for the amount of water you consume. Data is an inexhaustible resource. You can make infinite copies of it, and you don't consume your data. It is rather a currency for a service you use. But on top of being logically fallacious, it wouldn't even work. Tax and data collection wouldn't protect your privacy. Every piece of data on the planet would still be collected, just make it more expensive. And that extra expense can be easily covered by big corporations who are already dominant incumbents but it will be a barrier for new businesses, preventing them from competing with the big corporations. Privacy-focused email providers like ProtonMail or Tutanota would have it harder to compete with Gmail because the new tax burden would be heavier on the smaller businesses than on the massive global behemoth that Google is. I would worry if a service like Signal or WhatsApp were taxed for processing user data, even if WhatsApp were taxed a lot more than Signal. Signal is the best encrypted messaging app out there, and its business model is based purely on donations. If a portion of those donations had to go to pay new taxes, it would threaten the existence of Signal or other smaller privacy-focused projects, while WhatsApp would be fine because Daddy Facebook pays the bills. Shoshana Zuboff, the author of Surveillance Capitalism, suggests outlawing the markets entirely, just like we outlaw human trafficking or slaves. These markets undermine democracy and they undermine freedom and they should be outlawed 
We outlaw markets in human organs. We outlaw markets in human slaves because they have inevitable destructive consequences. That's another logical fallacy. Human trafficking or slavery is by definition immediate endangerment of life and health. There is no safe way of trafficking humans or enslaving them. It can only subjugate them to violence. Online ads were not designed for violence or subjugation. Although they can be used to show or disseminate violent messages, any tool can be abused like that and we don't outlaw them all. Zuboff doesn't suggest which markets we should outlaw, but if she's talking about all ad markets, then that would be extremely draconian and would kill independent creators on the internet. The only viable business model would be TV, and online ad markets is done inadvertently lead to destruction. Advertising can be done in a non-evil way. DuckDuckGo is a privacy-focused search engine that gets paid through Amazon ads. You heard it right, Amazon ads. And how is that good for privacy? Well, that's simple. DuckDuckGo shows you ads based on your search query and not your personal information. There are no DuckDuckGo cookies tracking your identity or browsing habits and there is no DuckDuckGo algorithm predicting your behavior. Your search records aren't blocked by DuckDuckGo or transferred to Amazon. And because of this, there is no personalization of search results. DuckDuckGo shows you the internet as it is, rather than what Google would want you to see. It makes less money, but it's a sustainable business model that respects user privacy. Even evil ads like YouTube ads do have an irreplaceable role in online media. Journalists and other publishers can produce content and get paid by ads, without compromising their integrity by making direct deals with advertisers. YouTube is far from ideal, in fact it's part of the problem. A more optimal state would be if YouTube used a more privacy-respecting ad platform instead of Google to generate revenue. There is an alternative ad platform under development by Brave that allows users to opt into viewing privacy-preserving ads and using their revenue to reward their favorite creators. It may not be an ideal solution right now, but it's a far better step in the right direction that already exists. Now just imagine if you had a choice to pick which ad platform to opt into when using YouTube. Would you choose Brave? or Google Ads. There is a reason you don't have this choice. Google holds YouTube as their intellectual property. Google doesn't allow YouTube to exist outside of their grip. The only way to use it is with all the Google tracking ads and algorithm. If YouTube was open source, there would be different versions of the YouTube app that would allow you to watch videos without Google Ads and tracking. Newpipe is an excellent app that does this already. It's an open source front-end YouTube alternative, but it is not allowed to be listed in Google Play Store or iOS App Store, so the only way you can get it is from FDroid or download an APK directly from a new Pi website. Your only option to communicate with people of a particular service is to sign up for that service. But what if you could communicate with anyone on any app without needing to create an account for each of those apps? You could have a secure Signal account and text with your friends on Instagram, WhatsApp or iMessage. Matrix is a protocol that seeks to break the walls of ecosystems by providing a decentralized protocol that can bridge communication between apps. Matrix is a decentralized, free and open source software, so naturally none of the big tech corporations want to adopt it, because it would threaten their dominant market positions and monopolistic tendencies. Meanwhile, the open source community is heavily adopting Matrix, including big names like Mozilla, KDE and now even the German Ministry of Defense is launching a secure messenger based on Matrix. Matrix has the potential to decentralize the internet, much like the web did in its inception. World Wide Web was also released as free software, which is the only reason all of these big tech platforms are even allowed to have their own websites and why you are allowed to create your own website without asking for anyone's permission. Imagine if you could use Facebook, but choose a newsfeed algorithm that isn't controlled by Facebook. Maybe you just want the algorithm to show you the content of your friends and no groups or organizations. Or maybe you want to choose which content filters your newsfeed algorithm should use. If Facebook was open source, you would have an option to modify the Facebook app on your phone to suit your preferences. Right now you don't have this option, the only way to use Facebook is with everything and the only thing that Facebook bundles together. The social dilemma could have invited Gabriel Weinberg from DuckDuckGo, Moxie Marlinspike from Signal, Brendan Eich from Brave, or co-creator of Matrix Matthew Hodgson. It would have been an amazing insight from the polar opposite of the Silicon Valley. Instead we get a bunch of big tech rejects whose 
worldview is equally as narrow as it was when they were working for the Silicon Valley. Not all developers and projects are motivated by shareholder value. There are ethical companies like Purism or System76 that don't have public shareholders to placate. I've used way too many Linux distributions all for free, knowing they don't do anything that's against my interest or rights. How can I make such claims about these developers but criticize the big tech? Don't they all just want to make money just as anyone else? Or well, maybe they do, but I don't have to trust their word. Their software is open source. If I don't like something in Ubuntu, I can go to Linux Mint. Or if I want to go on that path, I can learn development and create my own version of their software. And now they have to compete with me and make things better. I can remove or add whatever component I like, and I don't have to submit to the authorship entitlement of developers. Regulation is not a solution we should surrender to at the cost of free and open source software. The current copyright and patent laws have been rigged by big media corporations, studios and global tech companies, from Disney through Apple to Google, to expand protections for their monopolies at the expense of everyone else. Any regulation that doesn't immediately revert back the expansion of copyright and patent laws to software is a half measure that doesn't offer any meaningful change at best or causes even more harm at worst. I'm an independent creator who is dependent on your support. There are not many channels that focus on these issues, so if you'd like to keep me alive, consider subscribing, joining the channel, and supporting me on Patreon. Thank you.